This is a full view of how I envision ethics, the categories which structure uh, an ethical life, yeah, and what we saw before were the categories simplified which structure uh, a whole and entire society. Here are some good pieces of advice listed as briefly as possible. Uh, yeah. I try to gather the greatest amount of useful uh, pieces of information. Uh, in the shortest amount of time and space. As I start recording this, we are the 12th of September 2023. And uh, I intend to talk for I don't know how long about introspection partly and my own um, psychological development as an individual. I don't do this very often. Uh, usually I try to talk about uh, scientific in the broadest sense uh, topics, but here uh, I will talk about uh, my own personal life uh, in some aspects. Uh, so, this video will not be very structured and ordered, contrarily to, at the moment of recording the last one, the latest one that I published, which is my video on, on ethics, my, my legacy on ethics, and it is probably one of the very best videos that I have produced, given the circumstances that I have encountered at this moment in time. So here we are, early September 2023. So I would recommend uh, that people uh, watch the video uh, My Legacy in Ethics because this is, in my view, one of the very best that I have produced uh, at this moment. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I have listed a few few uh, topics that I will that I intend to talk about. Um, yeah. 
first about talking publicly uh, on, on the internet for instance uh, we live in a, in a global village and if I could give a good piece of advice to anyone uh, watching this uh, is to, to be aware of this uh, uh, when you speak publicly you speak uh, in front potentially of everyone so my piece of advice that I could give is that if you are less than 21 years old you should not you shouldn't talk publicly that's an opinion but I that's a good piece of advice I think because the reason is the reasons are at 21 years old the, the brain of people usually hasn't had the time to fully develop uh, people have males especially a strong level of hormonal activity one might say they are not necessarily very mature or wise or there can be, there are exceptionally uh, gifted uh, young uh, adults or teenagers who are wise beyond their years, but most people, especially in the modern Western world, when they are 21 years old or, or less, they are not very mature most of the time. Yeah. I, would, I, would, I would even be tempted to to put the, the age limit at 25 years old because as far as I know uh, studies in uh, neurophysiology uh, say that basically the brain structures itself completely towards the age of 25 I'm not sure here it has to be checked but basically your brain up until probably 25 years old is not even fully mature yeah so ideally a good piece of advice is people really who are young or who think that they are not necessarily very knowledgeable or wise you, you can speak publicly but if you are not uh, if, if you think that you are not very wise or very much of or if you are not sure that what you have to say is relevant or enlightening or uh, smart it's better to not speak yeah there are a lot of people of all ages who, who say stupid things publicly sometimes they're really uh, dubious things stupid things very funny things as well very very intelligent things very intelligent as well uh, and it's okay but uh, I, I can say very dumb things. I'm aware of this. I can say very, very stupid things. But I'm aware of this. And uh, in a way, here I make, I make a remark. Uh, we live in, in a world uh, where public speech, here I talk in the case of the West, especially public speech, coming from the figures of, of, of authority, of moral or, or political authority has become in a way bland and insipid precisely because people they are conditioned to, to try to be as what they call politically correct but as a, as a, morally, politically uh, correct as possible to, to try to appease and please everyone etc and the, the intention can be good but the result is massive collective deception and or self-deception which very often leads to serious problems for a lot of people so taking the other alternative which would be being consciously prov provocative, trash talking, uh, being insulting, etc. It's stupid. Respond to, to this. I understand why it occurs, but it's kind of, of dumb. Uh, so what I encourage people to, to do is either to say relevant things 
or, or intelligent things or yeah or ask a question if uh, to, to, to speak intelligently and if they want to be provoking I, I recommend that they try to be thought provoking and not provocative that's a piece of advice uh, that I can give uh, yeah. Yeah. and then about the weight of words uh, I could repeat uh, the, the, the what I've just said about the situation uh, con considering uh, uh, concerning public speech uh, I speak in the case of the Western world but I can deduce that it's partly similar or in other parts but in the West it's pre prevalent public speech has become for predominantly the aforementioned reason completely insipid and bland and in a way it has become uh, it, it's kind of implicit for, for people who are vaguely uh, uh, I would say vaguely uh, aware or vaguely uh, vaguely awakened, one might say, about uh, the realities of politics, the media, etc. That most of the time, public speech is completely bland and insipid, or stupid, or deceptive, or, uh, or uh, all, all at once. Yeah, and in a way, it has become, uh, especially among the, the younger generations in the West who have had access to alternative sources of information, it has become public wisdom that most of what uh, the, the, the figures of, of authority say publicly is kind of, of worthless and stupid. Uh, not, not, not necessarily stupid, but it's kind of worthless. It can be stupid or, here I'm talking, for instance, about most political debates, a lot of, of articles in a lot of, 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 med of media or interviews, it's either it's insipid or bland or, or stupid sometimes. So the, the words that people utter in public, most of the time they have become meaningless uh, in this sense. And What I have been trying to do as an individual is, I will develop later on this to explain the reason, is to, to give more weight to, to my words. It's not always the case. I can say dumb things, stupid things, things that I regret uh, or that uh, I say uh, because it's part of speaking as a normal human being. Uh, you say things, okay, these are words, that are, but when I say things which I consider to be intelligent and relevant and meaningful, uh, I will talk about what I've been doing. I, I try to give weight to my words when I know, or, or at least when I believe that they are relevant and useful. And here, I just give an example. Uh, in the make a civic virtue uh, great again. It's just an example, I will develop later on this. But when I encourage others, for instance, to uh, clean the streets daily, I, I just illustrate, uh, I just, I, I do not uh, advise people to do this uh, meaninglessly. When I say this, I, I illustrate, I have started doing this, as far as I can remember, in October, 2022, I have started picking up mostly cigarette butts for a few minutes uh, each day. And since I have started doing this, I believe that it's a good idea. It's a good idea if, if uh, most people are dedicated uh, just five minutes of their, of their time daily or often in a week, just five minutes to pick up the trash in the street. If a lot of people did this, the streets of most Western cities would be cleaned uh, very quickly and they, they would remain clean. Uh, th that would be a great progress. Yeah. But when I encourage people to do this, for instance, 
I have been practicing this. So now it has been 11 months consistently with, I have not checked uh, every day, but I can reasonably, reasonably um, assume that 95% of the days I have done this for at least, I would say at least five minutes, uh, sometimes significantly longer, but at least five minutes. So when I encourage others, for instance, to clean the streets, these are not meaningless words in a sense that I have been practicing this, as I'm recording this, it's been 11 months in a row, and I have done this with, a, I can confidently say, a, a, probably a 95% accuracy rate. 95% of days for 11 months, I have done this at least, I would say at least five minutes every, every day. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I will develop on this, but that's just an illustration. I can say, I can say stupid things because for many reasons, either because uh, I'm not always very uh, inspired or uh, because I can be partly mature or partly okay. But when I say things that I believe or I know are intelligent and smart and true, uh, I try, I have tried and I will continue to try to give weight to my words. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Then I will talk about uh, my personal uh, case. It is connected with um, the. Well, here, just a, a brief remark. I wrote this a bit before. If, if there are some people, either who have been uh, following my videos for a long time or who might discover my videos at some moment, or I don't know when, but if I know that some people, when uh, at least they discover. Uh, some of my uh, inspired content, one might say, they, they, they I can trigger uh, an enthusiastic uh, response sometimes, I know this. So here, I try to be honest uh, with those who might uh, relate. When I discovered, my, when I discovered Hegel, uh, five and a half years ago. Uh, I already vaguely knew about Hegel when I really discovered I was, it was mind blowing. Mind blowing in a sense, whoa, completely mind blowing. <laughs> five, five and a half years later, my relationship with Hegel, well, <laughs> there are ups and downs, one might say. <laughs> but very, no, not very often, but this is the guy that I, okay, the, the, the boring German metaphysician. So yeah, after five and a half years of a <laughs> intense relationship, I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that the, the, the temperature has cooled sometimes slightly, but yeah, so here it's out of honesty. There is a song by Rihanna and Eminem, Love the Way You Lie, Part 2. Uh, the part by Rihanna explains us. So here explains a lot, illustrates a lot. So here, if read, there, there are people, I know there are a few maybe, and there will be maybe more, who might be uh, very enthusiastic. Uh, at some moment, maybe when they uh, discover some of my content. Do, do not uh, let yourself be fooled too easily. <laughs> Seriously, I am, uh, I am glad when there are people who appreciate uh, some of the things that I produce, I would, I would lie precisely if I said that I, I am not happy or grateful when I notice that I can bring a good uh, 
to others, but yeah, it's it's difficult to say. But uh, try to to remain cool-headed as long as possible. Uh, yeah. I got deceived by Hagar for, for the better, most of the time. But, uh, well, yeah. 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 So, about um, being taken seriously, I have suffered in my personal life for a long time now, for various reasons, of of not being not being taken seriously so it's part of my uh, one of my um, i wouldn't say psychological problems but at least um, it's a feature of of my personality uh, i um, because there, there was a moment still is the case when I a moment in my life when I try to share uh, thoughts ideas which I believed and actually knew and yeah, believed were really important and I was not uh, I did not succeed in communicating I understand why, and I understand why there are, were misunderstandings. I understand more and more why there are misunderstandings. But uh, this explains, uh, and I, I, here I'm kind of intelligent enough to understand that it explains a part of my psyche. This is what I intend to talk about in this video. My, my some of my psychological characteristics. I I feel. I would say unconsciously, but actually more and more consciously, a need to compensate the fact that I have not been taken seriously when I then wished that I were, would. So I tried, and in a way I still do, to, to compensate by being hyper, uh, in a way rigorous, either in the way I, I think or uh, in the, the things that I do. Uh, here I, I speak. Uh, I speak to myself. I don't know when I will rewatch this or yeah, but it's part of my psychology. I uh, I, I partly suffer from this. I I try to work on this, but uh, yeah, it's just another aspect which is partly connected. Like the previous one, although uh, I do not necessarily um, mention it, but po it's partly autism, I would say. Uh, I will talk maybe uh, about autism, uh, but uh, I have started in uh, August, September 2016, an intellectual journey. I had already started uh, 2013, so as I'm recording this, 10 years ago, but actually it really changed significantly in 2016. Uh, I started to take the red pill, as they call this, on the internet. And I traveled b between August, September 2016 and January 2018, so approximately, approximately 18 months, approximately, I traveled uh, intellectually and spiritually uh, at an extremely fast pace, and I, I visited <laughs> the entire spectrum of, of, of human knowledge very uh, superficially because it happened extremely fast but I if I could formulate this I let unconsciously but the, the totality 
of world knowledge uh, uh, pervade my, my mind. I, 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 uh, I acquired, in a way, uh, very superficially, precisely because it, it occurred in a very short amount of time, but in the matter of 18 months, broadly, I, I, I went from being very ignorant on, on most topics, while being ignorant that I was ignorant, to being not knowledgeable, but to being aware of, of a completely different uh, intellectual and spiritual perspective on the world. So I, I accumulated an enormous amount of information in a very short amount of time. So I traveled faster in 18 months than most people, most educated, intelligent people travel sometimes in their entire lifetime. So I, I, I really, uh, I really traveled extremely fast in a way too fast because uh, if I had to use the illustration Neo in uh, the Matrix movie uh, when he learns uh, Jiu Jitsu, an enormous amount of information incorporated in the mind in a very short amount of time. And in a way, I will partly talk about this in the video, it was too heavy, uh, too much, too fast. Uh, yeah. yeah. And I will use an, an illustration how I envision this. If we uh, envision a, a race, uh, an athletic uh, race, a marathon or an Olympic uh, race or whatever. Uh, I, that's a way of, of formulating, but it's like as if I started running. At some moment there, there is fog and I keep running and I don't see any other runner uh, around me, so my, here it's partly tied with my autism, uh, or autism can, can explain. So in a way, I kept running, see, that's a way of talking, I kept uh, moving forward, but there were less and less people around me, so my belief, here it's retrospective projection, that's not how I interpret this, but it's in a way, a way of talking, it has lasted more than 18 months. In a way, it has been a feature since precisely this, this time, early 2018. I have kept running, that's a way of talking, at, at a very fast pace and, and seeing less and less people around me. And it made me believe that I was, in a way, too slow. And here it's connected with not being taken seriously. When I have had the opportunity to interact variously with other people uh, for the past uh, you know, five, let us say five years, uh, a, a lot of what I say, when I speak uh, about interesting topics more than just small talk, I mean, small talk can be uh, interesting, but when I talk about really interesting topics, usually there are no reactions or very few reactions. And I have had th this belief for a very long time that like the, the guy who races forward and he sees no other uh, runner, so he believes that maybe he's, he's last and that all the others are way ahead, so he, have to, he has to run even faster, make even more effort, be, be more, even more athletic, uh, mo even more focused to accelerate, to, to go even faster, because he believes that all the others are, are far ahead, I, actually, here, it's not to say, oh, I'm bragging, I'm super smart. No, precisely, no. But actually, it's maybe the reason why I have been alone on my mental, intellectual path for a very long time is not because I was kind of dumb and, and all the others, uh, they, they do not react when I talk most of the time because what I say is not interesting, which is which has been the belief that I've held because I had empirical reason to believe this. But actually, no, it, I've understood. I understood already 
already last year, but now I formulate this in a way which is intelligible for myself and for actually others who, when uh, they might watch this. I really have had this belief, that's how I explain this, that I was lagging far behind. There are empirical reasons, because empirically I have no higher education, I'm a high school dropout, uh, etc. Et I read, I have spent now uh, almost 10 years reading really highly intelligent books by PhDs, by, by philosophers, by great scientists, are most of most of the time when I read, and I read a lot, so I, I live in, in a intellectual bubble. Uh, I have lived, I partly still do, but I make and I have made great efforts to try to reconnect with an ordinary level of consciousness while being able to interpret the world in a, in a philosophical way, one might say. I have made, and I continue to make, great efforts to reconnect, which is kind of good in a way, but for a very long time I have lived in an intellectual bubble and while believing that, that I was ignorant on many topics, in a way I am, but because you are always uh, the idiot of someone else or you are always the ignorant of someone else, there is always someone who is more knowledgeable than you. Uh, But uh, I um, here again. I, I am progressing. I, this video is partly will partly be about my my psychological development. In a way, growth in the, in the good sense that I improve. Uh, there are many problems. Sometimes I. Uh, I am a little bit regressive in some aspects, but the overall trend is I improve uh, psychologically in my uh, level of maturity, one might say. I had to thank God, I do, but um, here I, I make a remark that I've already made, but Newton made this remark already. When you become really smart and knowledgeable, uh, you become aware of your own ignorance. Paradoxically, it's not paradoxical, it's dialectical. The more you learn, the more you become aware of all the things that you are not aware of in the gigantic field of, of, of knowledge. So, actually, the more you become knowledgeable, as, as an individual, and, and eventually in relation to most other individuals, the more you become ignorant in, in, uh, in relation to the, to the perspective of the totality of knowledge that you might envision, and here every uh, great scientist is aware of this, uh, every discovery is like a discovering a, an, an uncharted island in, in a gigantic ocean. So the, the, the more you discover something which seems to make sense and, and be uh, correct in the realm of science or knowledge, the more you become aware of a, a vast, a greater uh, potential number of, of topics or fields which uh, become even more obscure. It happens in physics. Uh, the, 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 every time there is a progress in science, of course, it, it's good in the perspective of understanding the world, etc. But usually, it opens even more complexity. Uh, yeah. So that's why a form of super intelligence can lead to stupidity. I'm aware of this. I try to work to. To be less stupid less often but it's again it's dialectical when you are be, when you become really super super smart or super super knowledgeable actually you become kind of dumb in a way yeah 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 i'm aware of this i'm aware of this okay now about autism oh I have a lot of problems and I understand 
when people they have problems they need they have a psycholo psychological need to put the burden of, of suffering onto an entity to relieve to, to alleviate the burden of suffering that's how human functions that's how it is when people suffer most of the time they seek uh, either a culprit or at least a, a, a reason an excuse or, or if it's not a culprit or if it's not an excuse at least a, a reason onto which they can put the burden of their suffering at least psychologically and it, it alleviates a lot it's true so i try i try to the best of my psychological abilities given my development of course when i suffer i i'm like a, everyone else in this sense it, it, it feels better to have an entity onto which you can put the blame of if not the blame the burden uh, of, of uh, the weight of uh, suffering when you can find something or someone if it's something it's better than someone because yeah when you can find an entity onto which you can put the burden of suffering it makes you feel better because you feel less guilty and humans they need this i understand i understand and i try i try Of course, what is good in psychology and morality, the good, which is, of course, very difficult to reach, is to blame, uh, not to blame the others, or at least to blame the others, the, 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 less, uh, the, the least amount of time, and if others have to be blamed, it's more fair to blame those who are more intelligent, more powerful, more privileged, I understand. So the, the ideal is to, to, to reduce the, the weight of the burden that is projected onto others, because the others, a lot of time, they do not... Um, they are not responsible precisely. Yeah, that's, words of wisdom it's difficult to it, it's very easy to say wise things it's very easy uh, but to be wise uh, it's more difficult obviously but my uh, my psychological uh, the way i function psychologically i'm aware of this because uh, because i understand uh, how I function in some aspects. When I'm not very, uh, very inspired, maybe, or very, uh, when I'm not uh, at the top of my game, one might say, I tend to blame, well, depending on the circumstances, I can blame socialism, the CIA, yeah. At, at some moment in my psychological development, I tended to blame uh, the absence of a father, or at least a father figure. I have come to understand that uh, in this uh, in this topic uh, on a personal level that's a problem that cannot uh, that cannot be solved so in a way if it cannot be solved it's not a problem because uh, if i know it's uh, difficult to say this but if a problem cannot be solved that's again dialectics the good thing is that it no longer is a problem it means you can uh, it's it's pointless to try to waste your time or energy to try to fix something which cannot be fixed yet yeah, so i have overcome the, the i mean partly uh, it's partly still a source of uh, 
it can alleviate to say, ah, oh, if I had had a father who had taught me clearly to do this or do that, I would have led a better life. I would have made better choices. It's it's very appeasing and alleviate. Uh, it alleviates a lot of, of suffering to to imagine this. Yeah, but for reasons that are too complex to mention here. Yeah, I, I tend less and less to mention this because, yeah, but I have found another uh, culprit, no culprit, but I tend to really when I have really problems that are really difficult to solve or I really struggle to, to, to tackle when I say. I tend to play the autistic card, which actually is partly true. Learning, I discovered this, I, I was vaguely aware already uh, five years ago, but I really discovered this, I might say, uh, December 2022, I would say, I really started to get interested in the topic and it has helped me understand a lot. And when you understand that there are features which make you act in a certain way which can be detrimental to others or to yourself or both that are you know beyond uh, beyond uh, your uh, I would say not beyond your control but which are really difficult very difficult to solve of course that's a psychological trick in the good sense it alleviates the suffering so when i make dubious decision or really when I uh, it's really difficult and uh, one way of uh, struggling or, or, or easing the struggle is to say okay I have autism uh, it makes things really difficult it's partly yeah I'm intelligent enough it's partly a trick in a sense okay it's easy to play the card, uh, I have psychological problems. Is that, well, here, I'm not talking for ordinary people, but for people who really, uh, I would say, in situations like me, there are not many, but it can be comforting psychologically just to say, okay, uh, I have problems with, I mean, pro I have. These are features of my personality. Yeah. So I, I understand. I understand when really it's really difficult, and I struggle to cope. So I say to myself, "Okay, uh, that's autism. I do a lot of effort, but there are certain things which are really more difficult. So that's one way of appeasing. Sometimes it's dishonest in a sense. Okay, things are difficult. The burden is heavy. Let's play the card. Uh, the, in this case, in my case, the autistica, okay, partly sometimes it's a, a cheap way of uh, alleviating the burden, but partly here when I'm in a way kind of serious and honest with myself in a good sense, when I, I'm compassionate with, uh, with myself because sometimes uh, things are very, very difficult and uh, there are things that I cannot I cannot solve uh, because, uh, yeah, in this case, I say to myself, okay, uh, things are the way they are. Uh, there is uh, no other option than in my, my own psychological relationship with myself to say, okay, that's autism. Uh, that's how it is. Uh, There is suffering, either there can be suffering with indifference or disdain, self-disdain or self-pity, etc. Or simply self-compassion, which is kind of good in this sense. So, yeah. The same happens partly with schizophrenia. Yeah. Uh, here I will talk about dialectics. In my psychological development, it has happened 
often, what I might say, that I, I try to do something which I really believe, genuinely believe is good. And at some moment, I discover that actually it, it, it was not good or it was good, but it brought about negative consequences. Therefore, it was not really good. So the, this dialectical trick has happened to me a lot of time. When it happens for the first time, uh, well, you are kind of uh, psychologically devastated, one might say. But when we, with time uh, <laughs> passing, you get used to it in a way. So here, I laugh because I, I would, maybe I will talk about this about, about laughter. But I laugh because sometimes there's no other solution, one might say. Uh, but I've understood in my psychological, intellectual development, dialectics, uh, in the sense that very often uh, you, you do something which you genuinely believe is good and actually it turns out to be not good. Or, or uh, yeah. So, oh. um. then about what, let us simplify, what is good versus feeling good what is here yeah, it's really simp simple simple uh, it's not very complex but what is good would be objective let us say and feeling good would be a subjective feeling uh, i've been watching uh, more or less uh, regularly at various intervals people talking about um, christianity mostly uh, Americans deconstructing from Christianity, as they call this. And here I will make a, a few remarks. Um, I understand, here it's, it's valid for not only Christians, but for all people eventually. I understand that uh, people, they, uh, they, um, In a way, I would say they live through their feelings. I understand, and here it's a, a, a recent development, so it's part of my pro progression. There are a lot of people who live in objectively good circumstances in the broader sense the the, the the environment in the broader sense socio-economic cultural uh, in the broader sense the, the conditions objectively <clears throat> if we compare with either in time or in space the conditions are good here i will mention the book that i already mentioned the book by mr pinker uh, Enlightenment, enlightenment now, the case for reason, humanism, progress, science, etc. etc. So there are, actually it's, it's a human universal, there are situations where the objective conditions, socio-economic, cultural, political, or, 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 or even psychological, the, the conditions are relatively good, but people, they do not feel good. And th there is the opposite as well. There are situations which can be envisioned as being bad on many socio-economic aspects, etc. But people, somehow, they can feel good nonetheless. There are the two aspects. Uh, yeah, but... So here, I understand. Yeah. I, I, I develop my psychological faculties in terms of the ability to relate with others and to improve. That's a new development 
I become a better psychologist. I have had the, the metaphysical, uh, partly insane uh, phase. Now I improve, I become better psychologically in the ability to understand others and to understand uh, maybe their needs. Yeah. Because it happens to me as well. Uh, sometimes, actually, very often, actually, things are really good, not for everyone. Not for everyone, not everywhere, not at all times. Okay, but for, in the case of the modern West, for a lot of people, the conditions, socioeconomic, uh, etc., et are really, 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 really good in comparison with the past uh, 2000, the 200,000 years of human evolution. Yeah. And when you acquire a, a culture, uh, when you compare the average situation of most people uh, in the West, uh, in the second half of the 20th century, when you compare this with the average situation of the average human on planet Earth for the past uh, 200,000 years, the, the situation on many aspects had never been better and, and by a huge, huge, huge margin. Yeah. So here, I, I understand it. it's part, it's part, actually it's a, it's a fascinating aspect of, of, a, of the human condition. Here I will use an example from sports. In sports, uh, there are very often uh, champions, either in, in soccer, basketball, tennis, whatever, who are objectively exceptional. Exceptional. If you look at their results, their achievements, their performances, their statistics, whatever standard is used to, to, to measure their achievements, they are exceptional. I will not list names because people can find uh, vision, whoever they might think of, but who objectively, they are exceptional. But, and of course, a lot of times they are admirers, uh, respected, etc., etc., but they are not always um, loved as much as they ought to be if love had to be derived from objective standards of achievement. And the, the, the counterpart is there are in soccer, basketball, tennis, or uh, most other sports, great, great uh, players or great champions who are great objectively as well, but in a way they, they might be slightly less uh, performing in some aspect, but they arouse a lot more, um, sometimes admiration or, or love or, or, or enthusiasm on the part of the supporters. It happens very often that when there are rivalries, either between teams or between players or between uh, uh, champions in whatever sport, those who are objectively the best, they are not necessarily those who are the most well liked. Because in a way, people, they do not relate because they, in a way they are, they are too, uh, you know, like, like machines in a way. So people, they struggle to relate and very often, it's not always the case. There, there are various, uh, yeah, but a lot of people who actually, when they judge sportsmen, they associate greatness with emotion. Yeah. Yeah. That's why there are a lot of people who live in relatively good conditions but they do not feel good. Yeah. And there are a lot of people 
who they, they are loved but they do not experience this as being loved uh, yeah and i understand i understand i understand And here, the cheap trick to avoid is uh, when you do acts of what you believe on a personal level are acts of love or care or goodness for others, and when they do not experience this, when the, the, the result the way they experience the result of what, as an individual, you think is good for them, when, when they do not appreciate as you may hope or might hope that they would, it can bring uh, resentment or, or, or anger uh, on the part of the person who tried to do good to the other. So that's, again, that's dialectic. Yeah, and to be wise, I understand, means I will say intelligent things. <laughs> it's very easy to say intelligent things. It's much more difficult to uh, to apply them. <laughs> but when you make a gift, you should have no expectations uh, yeah, when you make a gift, if it's genuine, you should expect nothing in return. No, I mean, you shouldn't expect, but you shouldn't expect necessarily that you will be uh, loved back. Uh, And here I will say, uh, profound words, maybe. Um, actually, no, I will not say uh, what I think, but uh, yeah. So here, uh, yeah, that's not what I intended to say. What I intended, uh, I keep this for myself, but I will say something. Uh, I can be clumsy or dumb. I'm willing to, okay, I can be, psycho psychologically, I can be dumb sometimes. I can be clumsy. I can be immature. I can be... Uh, I can be, uh, well, I'm so intelligent that I, I yeah, that, that's, that's, that's kind of, maybe that's partly cunning, I don't know, but <laughs> I'm intelligent enough to know that when people, when they speak uh, publicly and when they, they uh, confess uh, their, uh, <laughs> no, th these are not sins, but their flaws, yeah, their flaws, when they confess their flaws, I'm intelligent enough because I vaguely read uh, Nietzsche, Spinoza, and because I'm intelligent also, <laughs> sometimes it, it feels good to, uh, <laughs> to feel intelligent. <laughs> but I, I, I'm, I'm aware that humans, humans, they, they love this usually when others, when they publicly... <laughs> I, I laugh because it's funny in a good sense, in a good sense. Humans really, they love when others, they confess their flaws. Yeah. I am flawed because, because for the, the humans usually, they appreciate this. <laughs> Very easy to manipulate uh, these humans. <laughs> no, I laugh here because sometimes, sometimes it's comical, but... <laughs> uh, Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
love hurts whether it's right or wrong. Uh, here I will comment briefly uh, a few remarks about good and evil. It's partly connected with what I've said earlier. Um, I have understood over the past the past year, one might say. So, yeah, as I record this, we're in September two thousand and twenty-three. Here, yeah, that's really that's really connected with autism. Now that I've understood, I will try not to use the autistic card, but I've understood. Uh, here, I, I have to praise um, a person, an, an autistic person who makes videos, and he mentions this uh, in some videos. It has helped me a lot to understand. Um, it has taken me a long time to realize that actually, uh, often, uh, Things which actually are good, uh, objectively, they can or they do actually bring suffering from a subjective standpoint. Uh, here, what I say is kind of subtle in the good sense uh, that, that actually, I mean. Very few uh, thinkers uh, understood this, or no, no, maybe no, maybe not, no, but very few um, talked about this in an intelligent and subtle way in their uh, philosophy. And here I have to praise Nietzsche, who, that's not how he formulated this, but he was aware of this, Hegel as well, uh, and others, but. Sometimes you can have the intention of doing good to others. So you can have the intention of doing good to others and actually the results for the other or for the self are not good. Here it's, it happens often, but sometimes you can have the intention of doing good and objectively doing good but the way it is received is nonetheless felt and experienced as being a source of suffering in a way. So sometimes you can have the intention of doing good, but actually you do bad and it brings suffering. Sometimes you can have the intention of doing good and you really do good, but it nonetheless brings suffering. And sometimes, Thank God, <laughs> you have the intention of doing good, you really do good, and those that you intend to do good to, they really appreciate. Sometimes it happens. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> I laugh, yeah. No, but actually what I say is kind of intelligent. It's very difficult to. It's very difficult not to understand because yeah, empiricism can be useful, but it's very difficult to conceptualize. But actually, Hegel knew this. Yeah, but uh, 
the problem, the problem with, with this, it's tied with the dialectics, that when you believe that you are doing good, genuinely, you, you genuinely, be, you can genuinely believe that you are doing good and actually you are doing really uh, things which are uh, negative, yeah, but sometimes you can really believe that you do good and you can do things which are, which can be reasonably considered to, to be good, but it nonetheless brings suffering. And when you realize this, you can have, in a way, some sort of an existential crisis. Because it, it's... It... Um, it forces you to... to reconsider your worldview, which in a way can be good if it enables progress, but... It's not that you will be skeptical about the good. That's not that's not uh, the purpose. But actually, if if you believe that you are doing good, and there are reasons to believe that that you do good, but actually, it doesn't bring good. It forces you, in a way, to, to seriously question uh, yourself, and uh, yeah, uh, and uh, and here again, the trap, the trick to avoid is again, if you do good and you believe to do good, but actually. Uh, those that you try to do good to, they do not appreciate the way you believe that they might appreciate or whatever, or they do not uh, reward you the way you might have expected them to reward you or whatever, then you can, it can turn into a resentment. Yeah, that, that's a trap, that's a trick to avoid. Yeah, I will make a joke. Let us laugh about the German metaphysician. <laughs> Let us laugh because here Nietzsche says somewhere uh, man uh, had to invent laughter because. Uh, only he suffers uh, so greatly that yeah, yeah, it's part of psychological improvement. Sometimes laughing, of course, uh, is not a sign of uh, psychological growth or health. But sometimes laughter is just. Uh, I will not say what I was thinking precisely because what, yeah. formulated without the the way I envision it. Basically, the German philosophers uh, when you when you wander through life, when you understand. Here I have to praise. I have to praise the genius of Nietzsche and, and Hegel. I can, uh, at some point earlier in the video, I talked about the, the boring German metaphysician. The good thing, I will, I will, I will be enthusiastic. The good thing about Hegel is that, <laughs> is that even after many years of uh, a difficult relationship sometimes, Hegel here, that's one of one of the greatest praises. Maybe here, in the chronological perspective, I don't think that I have praised Hegel 
in such an intense way for a very long time. But Hegel still succeeds in surprising me for the good. After all those years, I'm still surprised by the, the depth and the, gen <laughs> the, the genius of Hegel. I haven't said this. Here, I'm in a positive mood because I hadn't said this in a long time, of course. <laughs> over, the, over the past months and years, no, over the past months and the past year, I have accused Hegel of, of being a boring German metaphysician very often. Uh, I've been, uh, well, pissed off, I don't know, but, uh, <clears throat> well, not, not pissed off, but, But it hadn't happened to me in a while to be amazed by the genius when it happened. <laughs> when it happens, it's like falling in love for the first time with the, the magic and the... It, it, maybe here, I don't know, I don't empirically, if at some moment there are long time married couples, really, a husband and a wife who have been married really for a long time, uh, more than 20 years, maybe more than 30 years, if after all this time, your wife or your husband still succeeds in <laughs> reviving the, <laughs> the flame of passion that arose, uh, I don't know, 15, uh, 20, 25 years earlier, I don't know, if your partner still succeeds in blowing your mind after many years of marriage. I don't, I, I, I can, maybe it does not happen in a lot of couples, but the couples in which it really occurred, like the, I don't know, a couple, they are in, in their 50s or 60s or maybe 70s and they still have moments of Words that are not needed. Moments of... After all these years... <laughs> if there are couples like this on planet Earth, maybe they are... Of course, they are blessed by God. But in a way, it's a form of blessing that very few uh, humans have the privilege of experiencing. So if somehow at this moment people watch this and if they can relate to this if there are a couples in their 50s 60s 70s or beyond who knows if they relate somehow at someone to these words they words words will not be needed there will just be the the look <laughs> sure, I'm in a positive mood. I'm in a positive mood. It's not. It's not always the case. <laughs> I had a complete mental breakdown uh, this mo this morning. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> positive and the neg negative. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who said that Hegel was a boring German metaphysician? Who is the idiot who had the audacity of accusing Hegel of being boring? I wouldn't want to <laughs> to live with this <laughs> to live with this guy. <laughs> no, you're not, that's a joke. That's a joke. <laughs> that's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Words are not uh, are not needed. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> I could stop. I could stop the video here. <laughs> I will go. I will go and drink a glass of a glass of water. Okay, uh, now I will resume uh, talking about other stuff. Framework about what I call the <clears throat> Spinozian nihilism. I I have given it's part of my uh, psychological growth. I have given up on this, and I will explain what Spinozian nihilism is, or what what it means when I use this term is. When you are confronted with difficult problems, actually, that's that's what I have tried to do for uh, for a long time, especially in the year two thousand and twenty-two. Here, yeah, what I say is kind of serious, and here, I don't know when the video will be published, when it will be watched, by who, but if there are people other than myself as an individual who watch this, here I give really uh, profound thoughts about, uh, I mean profound thoughts about uh, determinism and free will. Actually, it's very simple, but when, when you don't want others to be hurt, well, of course, you can try to, to limit, reduce, or prevent uh, to, to, the, to the greatest uh, extent possible, to, to limit the, the physical, psychological, emotional suffering. Yeah. But when you are in a situation where you can't do that for whatever reason, you don't succeed. There is suffering, emotional, psychological, uh, physical, uh, mental, there, there is suffering. How do you remove or try to, what to do to try to remove the suffering? I thought about this for four years and years, one might say. And the, the, The solution, 
I mean, what, what I thought was a solution was to remove the metaphysical suffering, namely to remove free agency. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's extremely complex as a philosophical system, whether the system of uh, Spinoza or uh, Hegel or uh, partly Fichte or, or all the people who are uh, who have a de de deterministic view of uh, I wouldn't say of uh, of, of free will, precisely, but those who have a, a deterministic view, uh, just a deterministic view, and the, the classical example in philosophy is Spinoza, and Fichte, partly because he was intelligent, he, he praised, in a way, Spinoza by acknowledging that to be a rationalist means necessarily to be a Spinozian, and Hegel incorporated uh, the Spinozian moment in his system. What did you expect? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but here I. I I say uh, what, what I have been doing for a very long time, especially in the year 2022. I have, pre presently I have g given up uh, consciously on this, partly not because uh, how should I explain this? Because maybe it had reached a point of uh, a form of nihilism, precisely. Uh, namely, when you really try to remove the suffering and you are in a position where you cannot uh, on the physical, emotional, uh, psychological level, or at least not as extensively as it might be uh, wished for, then the solution is at least to remove the metaphysical suffering. And what I call <clears throat> Spinozian nihilism, in a way, it means to say to the others, you know, that's ca Calvinist theology, actually, in theology that's Calvinism, in philosophy that's Spinoza, is to say, you have no free will. To the, you have no free will, and therefore, if there is no free will, there is no good and evil, there is no vice and virtue, there is suffering and pain on various levels, but at least in, in a deterministic perspective, there is not the burden of responsibility uh, on a metaphysical level. So, again, it comes from a good intention to try to, to steal, not to steal, but to erase the liberty of others. Because if others are not free, it means they are not responsible. But it, it, it comes from a good intention. It's partly good because people I can anticipate when they, uh, at some moment, when uh, the, the, the ontological structure of reality will, will be revealed, a lot of people will say, okay, we were quite satisfied, no free will, that's okay for most people, and if they can say, okay, we had no free will, that, that's, that's okay. I, I know a lot of people, if, uh, 
I, some plane of existence. Okay, we uh, okay. Th that's okay with us. So okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, so in a way, it, it's it's very um, it, it it comes from good intentions. It can do a lot of good, but it can also turn into it can become problematic because if you say to people, "I I am trying to steal your freedom," but but it's for your own good, people they they start saying. Uh, they, they, they might become skeptical and, and yeah, Th that's an illustration yeah. of, uh, of the dialectic. And I have set this view aside to use Spinoza to, to uh, I would say, to win every debate. Someone uh, either uh, makes an objection or complains or whatever. The, the, the Spinozian card is to say, you are fully determined to say this, to do this, to behave like this. Etc. You are determined. Yeah. Using this, this card, it's, uh, at, at some point it becomes a... Uh, It's uh, in a way it's anti-human. Uh, it is perceived as being anti-human. Uh, so to behave normally, it's a psychological need that a lot of people have. A, a lot of people they need to attribute agency. Uh, self-caused agency to other individuals. Even if the overwhelming majority of scientific works in physics, chemistry, biology, uh, sociobiology, uh, psychology, economics, sociology, actually all fields of science is in a way nothing but an attempt to remove Free will in the ordinary sense, where it is consistent. Maybe science consists in rationalizing the world, maybe to, to set relationship of necessity, to, to, to rush, rationalize, maybe to remove free will in, in, in humans. That's either it's the purpose or it's the, one of the consequences of the scientific enterprise. Spinoza is just the most rigorous in this perspective thinker. Yeah. But precisely humans, in spite of the overwhelming amount of evidence piling up, th this is part of the, the, the interesting aspects of, of, of human beings. It's kind of fascinating in a way. It's it's, it's really interesting. Uh, there is a a subjective revolt against the objective order of the world, but for the good. Yeah. Namely, there can be a revolt, a psychological revolt against the objective world order because. It's too dif difficult or too uh, con constraining or too, uh, too, too, too difficult and yeah, but there are those who revolt, revo that's the way of talking, they revolt against science. Actually, they don't. Science can, uh, yeah, but that's how they explain this, namely, they, they, they um, Unconsciously, that's what most humans do, because most humans behave as if all other humans had free agency. That's a, a, a classic in philosophy. Uh, if, all, uh, if all the criminals are determined to act the way they do, does it mean that they are innocent? Does it mean that they have to be released uh, from prisons? Uh, 
the cheap answer is to say that maybe uh, they are innocent because they are determined, but the judges and the policemen who put them into jail are as determined as the, the criminal. So they are as innocent in. Here, yeah, that, that's kind of the insane uh, philosophical, theological perspective, which actually makes a lot of sense, is that if, from a, a Calvinist, Spinozian perspective, if human beings have no free will, it means that criminals are innocent metaphysically, therefore, those who put them in jail are guilty because they are guilty of putting innocents in jail, but precisely the, the, the common sense response is to say that, okay, if the criminals are innocent metaphysically because in a deterministic worldview they have no free will, then the judges and the pol policemen who put them into jail, they are innocent as well. Innocent, innocent, innocent for putting other innocents into jail. Yeah. Yeah. So, this uh, aspect of uh, philosophy, namely to turn philosophy in some sort of a a, a contest uh, of, of trying to outsmart, but in a in a in a kind of dubious way, other uh, no no. No, not in this sense, uh, no. That's really what I call Spinozian nihilism. There are a lot of good aspects about the philosophy of Spinoza. Uh, but, yeah, this aspect, uh, no. Okay. Uh, here I will talk about uh, the perspective of the totality. Um, If one thinks about the world in terms of an organism, one total organism, which would be a Schellingian Spinozism, actually, um, Um, obviously, uh, every suffering of, of, of every part is a suffering of the whole organism. Uh, yeah. And when you are kind of intelligent, it brings about a lot of anxiety and in a way a lot of suffering because you are able to envision a broader perspective and in a way the more extended your perspective is, the more all-encompassing your perspective is, the more suffering it encompasses in a way. Those who only uh, care about their own individual perspective as individual. I'm not judging morally, but those who just, in this case, I'm, I'm not making judgment, but those who really live in their narrow, uh, self-centered. Here, it's not, it's non, it's non-judgmental. It's just to explain the people who just think of reality or the world or whatever as their personal self and eventually their few interactions etc. 
you know why these people when they have a good um, phase they feel good when they are in a bad phase they feel bad or depressed or whatever but their problems they are limited to themselves as individuals when you think when you think when you think because thought is universal the the, the broader your your range of perspective is the greater the amount of of suffering you incorporate at least cognitively and that's why intelligent people they tend to be more anxious because they see not necessarily with their eyes but with their mind they see a lot more problems many more problems than most people who are more narrow-minded for whatever reason uh, who are more self-centered here it's a non in, in a non-judgmental way i'm not saying the, the, the those who have a broader perspective are uh, are better or no I, I just said they are more intelligent uh, in whatever sense is, is defined when they are capable of having a broader perspective but precisely it, it, it brings very often a lot more anxiety and suffering. Yeah, that's another example, a really simple example of dialectics. Uh, being intelligent a lot of time causes suffering and being less intelligent often, here I will say partly things which are not especially uh, profound, but also I would say very intelligent things that I have already been aware of, but in a way, in a way, the people who are more intelligent, whatever the definition of intelligence, let us say IQ, it's more subtle than that, more complex, but let us say for the purpose of simplification, people with a higher IQ in modern societies, in a way, uh, statistically, they tend, on average, to be better off in many aspects of socio-economic life, many aspects, on, on average, they, they tend to be better than those who are less quantitatively intelligent. Yeah. So it might seem at first glance that the, the intelligent have it all good and those who are less privileged in terms of intelligence, things are more difficult. And in a way, it's true. It's true. In a way, in modern societies, life is much more difficult on many aspects for people with lower level of intelligence. It's true. And it's easier for those with higher level of intelligence. It's true on many aspects. But the counterpart is that... Here, it's... it's <laughs> I know when people, it might sound oh, bragging, oh, arrogant, no, precisely no. But people who are more intelligent, they are aware of this. Here I, I anticipate the people who are slightly, I, I, no, 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 the, the, the intelligent people, they tend to, to disagree with other intelligent people who complain about the suffering that intelligence brings to them by saying, Oh, why do you complain? Those who are less privileged, uh, they, really, they have it more difficult than you. So I understand it's a struggle between two types of intelligent people. But actually, I'm willing to, 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 to agree, I've said this, with those who say, if you are more intelligent than average, you shouldn't complain. In most cases, in a way, that's true. But there is a type of psychological suffering which is connected with what I said, I mean, to have a broader perspective means more anxiety, uh, to be constantly overthinking, uh, trying to, to, to anticipate everything, to be more aware of, of uh, the, 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 the dramatic uh, uh, events which affect uh, the, the whole of society or, or the, 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 the world at large. It's, it, it has a lot more impact when you understand uh, than when you don't. Yeah. Uh, and here I just e examples I've already used but uh, someone like Eminem or Kanye West 
Ye, as is now called, but Kanye West, uh, Eminem, these are examples. Um, both of them are artistic geniuses in modern pop culture, in very different styles, but both are geniuses. And I know, without having any kind of information on their personal life, uh, except uh, when uh, Marshall Mathers talks about his life in his songs, but otherwise I'm not interested on a personal level on, on their... Uh, it's not that I'm not interested, but I haven't uh, studied their personal uh, life biography, but I know, so without knowing them, whatever it means as individuals, I know that both, they suffer greatly. When you are vague, it's not to sound uh, arrogant, but when you are vaguely intelligent, when, when you listen some of their songs, you realize that in order to produce this kind of art, they have suffered. So the people who might be tempted to say, oh, they are rich and famous, they have a lot of money, so they have it all good. No, precisely. Uh, is Eminem a great artist? Yes. Is Kanye West a great artist? Yes. Both are, are geniuses in their own right. And in a way, here I'm not an expert in modern pop music, but in a way, they, they are, these two, they, are, they have a, a level of genius that very few other male figures have. Yeah. And here, there is a distinction between genius and, and uh, uh, appreciating their music because you, you can appreciate or not some or most of their songs. That's a right that people have. They have a right to appreciate and not appreciate a moral right. But when you are, uh, when you have a culture, yeah, in the realm of pop culture and just creativity, there are things you are not, uh, you are allowed not to appreciate, but you are not allowed, morally, when I say, not to acknowledge the genius. Yeah. It's part of, of culture. When you acquire a culture, it works in old field. You, you have a right to your, uh, 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 a, a right to, to private property of, uh, uh, opinions, but uh, no, you, you can have your opinions, uh, yeah, but you have to acknowledge when you are kind of serious and when you have a culture, you have to acknowledge genius and brilliance when it occurs. Yeah. And these two men, are they happy? Uh, I'm not sure. And I'm, I'm even tempted to say I'm sure that they probably aren't. They have probably moments of, of happiness, of course, in their life, but uh, yeah, uh, it's, I'm not sure that they are very happy. So that, that, uh, that's a simple question to which I kind of know the answer. Is there talent? Is there a blessing or a curse, a gift or, 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 or poison? Uh, maybe it's a little bit of both. Uh, 
then about uh, the view of the totality uh, in a different way. Here that would be uh, not the totality or either the planet or the universe or the world, but to think with a, a total view in more narrow uh, in a more narrow sense. Uh, the left in the modern Western world. Here it's connected with my, my psychological development. I've understood this last year approximately, uh, 2000, uh, September 2022. I had a moment of clarity, one would say, after having been blinded uh, by <laughs> German metaphysics, probably. Uh, when here, that's part also of a, self compassion, I will say. Uh, When you judge something, anything, something which has quantitative extension, a whole with parts, yeah. Uh, if you judge just one aspect, It's very easy to make wrong judgments, precisely. Uh, if, if you don't see the full picture, uh, it, it's very easy to judge and it's very easy to misjudge. I, I understood this already a long time ago, but just formulating this uh, very simply, uh, the truth is the whole, the totality, uh, uh, sure it's really a cheap uh, trick that the left uses very often. But uh, when judging uh, anything, when I say, if you just emphasize uh, the, the worst uh, aspects, really the, the, well, the bad moments, when I say, you, 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 you put an overemphasis on what goes wrong, in whatever you judge, and you completely neglect all the things which go right. If this is the methodology, it's very easy to, to manipulate and, and to misjudge. And here, just a common sense remark, but just sometimes formulating a common sense remarks can help a lot, but the media, here, I, I will praise the wisdom of the ordinary people. The people, I'm, I'm not very often uh, in a populist mood, but here, I will praise the wisdom of the people. It's, it's genuine, it's genuine. The people, here in, in the sociological sense, ordinary people, they have a tendency to be aware that basically the media, they only narrate or report or put an emphasis or, or talk about negative events overwhelmingly. So that's why we, it, 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 it causes a lot of anxiety when you follow the media because overwhelmingly negative 
news appear and from all over the world. So you are confronted by just almost constant negativity, which of course creates a, a tendency towards a, a, either anxiety or depression or, or a negative uh, emotions and thoughts yeah but if and here uh, the, the negative aspects of course they exist and it's part of a honest journalism to report negative events which occur of course but if you just Imagine make a thought experiment. Let us imagine uh, Let us imagine that uh, for uh, a few days the media, the mainstream media only reported and, and, and shared and narrated only good news what most people consider to be good news marriages <laughs> that's a joke marriages birth uh, successes of all sorts uh, people who get uh, their high school diploma or their college degree uh, people who get a job promotion people who successfully uh, start a business uh, people who achieve uh, a growth uh, either psychologically or uh, in their business uh, people who get converted to uh, uh, a more uh, positive view of the world uh, whatever uh, initiatives of all sorts uh, ecological uh, successful ecological initiatives uh, uh, if you had an article every time that uh, a couple which were separated are being reunited uh, uh, every time uh, people get, get uh, cured from uh, whatever disease they had uh, every time things happen more or less well <laughs> every time uh, every time things function well and, and provides uh, ordinary satisfaction uh, yeah imagine the the power that, that it would have here I, I will make a joke it's not to be taken seriously but people if they re read the news just for a few days if there were only good news they would say but whoa this one this is wonderful we live in a world where uh, people are <laughs> I, will, I will make a joke i will make a joke <laughs> They would say, what? So, so many, uh, so many births, but people, they, they have sex most of the time. Do they, do they do something other than having sex constantly, uh, these humans? Uh, <laughs> that's a joke. That's a joke. It's not to be taken seriously. No, it's serious. <laughs> seriously. <laughs> if, if it happened, <laughs> imagine newspapers. Well, there are only good news, even the ordinary news. Uh, this morning, the sun uh, rose. Uh, uh, I don't know the simple things. Uh, things happen. Uh, I don't know. Uh, most people are healthy. Uh, most people in most societies they have food uh, decent food to eat uh, there are functioning services uh, things are functioning more or less if it was presented uh, in, in a, with all the power of persuasion uh, look how many successful people there are uh, the youth is brilliant uh, their results in school are uh, exceptional <laughs> Let us let us say, or oh, great news! Look how many people uh, successfully proceed in, in in successful and prospering business transaction every day. Look how many uh, uh, 
the businesses grow and thrive, how many problems are solved every day, uh, how many uh, love letters are written every day, uh, etc. If the power of persuasion of the media, the, the mass impact of mass communication has, if ordinary, yeah, it's kind of a cheap way of having a positive outlook on the world, but it's to try to compensate the, the really negative views of, of the media. Uh, if people found wonder in just looking at all the things which work, instead of listing all the problems constantly, and yeah, I'm well aware that there are many problems, and yeah, but if just just this change of perspective, it's in, if instead of listing constantly all the negative things, just the negative things, if people could look at the more positive sides in life, uh, not to, to be dumbed down and, and blinded and become a... happy and dumb, uh, it's okay to be happy if it does not require you to be too dumb to be happy, but it's, it's okay to be happy if, if uh, if it's okay, let me say. Um, yeah. Uh, But here, I, I just take a, an example, which just in the realm of economics. Because this is when I had my, uh, not a revelation, but a little bit co com coming back to sanity. It's not by reading Mr. Pinker, but by becoming aware of the kind of data that are shared in the book by Mr. Steven Pinker. Of course, it's very useful people who write books to say that things are not all that bad not always, not everywhere, there are good things in the world, well, it can help, <laughs> too, yeah. Um, I'm, not, I'm not blaming, here, I'm, I'm not in a mood to blame the left, because it's part, if, if I'm honest, it's part of, of a healthy, society that the bad aspects, the problems in a society ought to be brought to public attention to try to be solved. If you are honest, it, it is the, the driving force of progress. It's the negative which comes with the positive in liberal societies in the noble sense, namely these are societies which constantly question themselves because they debate constantly, uh, all problems are under scrutiny, that's the, the classical American uh, tradition. It, it has been the case in Western countries since the 18th century, but especially in the US. Of course, this, this view, this mindset of being constantly critical of, of, of every, everything which goes wrong, it's exhausting psychologically because you see all the negativity, but the counterpart, the good aspect, is that it brings about a tremendous progress and a constant progress, precisely because every tiny problem is under constant scrutiny by uh, commentators on the left, the right, journalists, intellectuals, and people are at least trying to solve the problems. Yeah. So here, I just say something which I realized, it took me really a long time to realize this, but liberal societies, in the noble sense. Here, let us say Western, in the classical sense of the democratic institutions in the, in the best sense, in the best sense. The good aspect about the Anglo-Saxon model and the, the modern West, let us say. I will not uh, talk too much about political theory, but modern Western society. Modern here means the past 300, century, uh, 300 years, 300 years, yeah. These societies are extremely self-critical because there tends to be 
a relative, a relative amount of free speech, public scrutiny, a culture of, of, of very high standards in terms of, of, of requirements, uh, de demands, uh, uh, counterbalance of power. So there is a constant criticism of everything eventually, which makes it very exhausting when you are an intelligent person here intelligent means just a person who has the interest and also the, the social uh, status to study all these things by uh, reading the newspaper uh, here, no, that's not intelligent but educated people can be intelligent without being educated or be educated without being intelligent obviously but educated people yeah who are constantly scrutinizing all the things which go wrong etc uh, it brings about a tremendous weight uh, burden constantly because you see all the problems and when you are plunged into this which is the case in most western societies uh, who, who where there is relative uh, amount of uh, liberty free speech etc of course the, the, the general mood in a way is, is, is very negative in a way, but it, this is what drives a constant search for improvement. So it's very demanding. But this is the, the result is the extremely high standards of performance in a lot of aspects. Yeah. Because here I just formulate uh, a view which it really has taken me a very, very long time to realize. But the, I will formulate this in a, not poetic, but uh, uh, the reason why Western societies are so criticized, mostly by Westerners themselves, but is often, very often, because they are critical they are criticized because they are critical self criticism uh, being being self critical brings about self criticism And here, it's just to explain that the standards that self-critical, self-investigating, self-inquiring societies have, it's valid for individuals as well, the standards, they are often very, very high. That's the dialectics of of, of, of intelligence and, 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 and uh, lucidity in a way, the more clear-minded you, you are, the more critical you are, because you see all the problems. And here, the left. Psychological growth requires that it, it's not good to be resentful. Uh, I understand why it happens, but it, it's not good. It, it means if you are resentful, you have still to improve or at least work to improve. But to be resentful against the left in the Western societies, it, it might seem uh, tempting. Sometimes it is because sometimes it's difficult. <laughs> no, but in a way, here I say wise things. It's easier to say wise things than to actually be wise. But let, let us begin by saying wise things. <laughs> yeah. In a way, here I will say I will say intelligent things. It's more difficult to uh, 
to apply, but at least uh, tr trying to know the good that that's the first uh, the first step in the right direction. That's why. That's one way of interpreting the teaching of Jesus, of course. Uh, when you say, uh, when, it's, uh, when, when Jesus says, uh, you have to, to love thy enemies. One way of formulating this in the realm of modern politics it means you have to respect your opponent even if it might be a little bit annoying sometimes because you have to to be intelligent enough to understand that those who criticize you constantly they keep you on edge they, they, they keep you performing precisely so the left from a western perspective the modern here modern means the second half of the 20th century 21st century Sometimes it can be a little bit annoying, all the criticism constantly, uh, things work more or less according to the standards of the left, which are very, very demanding, but it's never enough, uh, you have always to do better or better. When you are, when you think in terms of trying to preserve a decently functioning society, and you are under constant pressure, constant criticism, they complain about the tiniest uh, uh, error, mistake, uh, insufficiency, etc., etc. Not only of the present, but all the burden of the past, without ever mentioning the good aspects, without ever uh, emphasizing, here I will use Mr. Pinker, the fact that over the past couple of centuries, world population has been multiplied uh, eightfold, the tremendous rise in the standards of living, hygiene, healthcare, uh, life expectancy, uh, education, literacy, uh, relative democratization in the good sense. It's not always the case, but in a good sense of institutions. The results, objectively, they are absolutely stunning. They are unprecedented. In the entire history of uh, the human species, what has happened over the past couple of centuries, driven by capitalism, not only, but uh, predominantly individualism, proper, property right, uh, the free market, uh, separation and balance of power, the free institution, the uh, uh, public scrutiny, constant uh, debates, free speech, etc., etc. This is the driving force which has brought about stunning results. There have been, of course, if you of course, I understand, but if you just point the negative things without mentioning the mind-blowingly obvious exceptional achievements which have been performed, of course it's very easy to paint in, in a negative light, one might say. Yeah. That's why criticizing people is a way of, in a way, harming them, but also doing them good, because criticism can be a, a way to help others to say, okay, you should improve. That's, in a way, a, a, a way of... of uh, that, that's a, a tough way of, of loving the other by saying to him, you, you have to improve. You have to improve on certain aspects. Not, not always. If it is uh, really, it's great. You say, okay, well, okay, you are achieving. Okay, well, okay, that, that's okay. But sometimes you say, okay, you might be, you might make efforts to do a little bit better. Okay, it, it might appear as being negative, but actually, in a way, it's positive. And not criticizing people, it appears to be negative because people don't like to be criticized. But actually, if you don't criticize people, then you don't, you do not. Uh, incentivize them to, to improve, so then it's a way of harming them with the intention of not hurting them. So if you... <laughs> if you do good, if you do bad to people, even if you, you think you are doing them good, you, you hurt them. But if you had good intention, actually it hurts them. People, they complain. Uh, If you try to, to shake them 
out of a little bit of apathy to improve them. They might not like this. Whatever you do, people will complain. So you might as well <laughs> try to do good. Whatever you do, people are gonna complain. So you might as well try to do good. <laughs> so at least you will have the satisfaction of saying, well, at least I try to do good. <laughs> I suspect, I suspect <clears throat> that whoever designed human beings with all their complexities, probably he was a masochist, maybe. I think about a song by Rihanna. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, I made a remark, <clears throat> I wrote uh, trying to say intelligent things is part of my work. Uh, so it's just a, a remark which is kind of a how should I explain this? To say intelligent things. For most people who, who do say intelligent things, for most of them is the result of work and and, uh, and study and uh, an effort. There are people who spontaneously say intelligent things. That that's great for them and for others, but uh, here, just for, to illustrate, when I make these kind of videos, which are not very structured, etc., it might seem that I'm not working because I'm just uh, rambling in front of my uh, webcam. But actually, uh, the things that I say, which are intelligent or insightful, uh, they did not uh, spring forth uh, out of, uh, I don't know, A mysterious source of inspiration and wisdom and, and brilliance. No, uh, they are the result of, here we are in the year 2023, of 10 years of, I will not, I will not play the card, uh, I succeed, if I do, I succeed because I've worked very hard, because most of the time, no, not most, but a lot of time people who work hard, they do not necessarily succeed as it's a success. It's, it's a reward in itself, but they do not, they do not necessarily succeed socioeconomically as much as they might expect to. Or, yeah. And those who succeed a lot uh, in uh, entertainment or uh, culture or uh, acting or sports or whatever, they might be very successful and claim that they have worked very hard. And it's true that, seriously, read the, the great achievers uh, who, who are... Uh, here I'm not talking about the, the, the entrepreneurs. Uh, here, for them, the overall majority, they really have to work really hard to succeed. But people in entertainment, in a broader sense, who are successful because they have a talent, a lot of time it really requires a lot of work. It really does. But what I do, uh, when, I, when I speak like this, here, 
I have not worked thoroughly to prepare this video that I have been recording for you know, more than two hours. I have spent, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, a, a couple of hours if we include thinking about what I intended to talk about plus writing a few notes. But so it's not really a lot of work. But when I say intelligent things, it's the result of, of 10 years of intense studying. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, here I had listed uh, all the things that I have consistently and constantly performed uh, in, the, in the realm of uh, ethical pieces of advice, the stuff that I've listed uh, on the documents uh, make household management great again, make puritanism great again, make sick virtue great again, make your body great again, etc. etc. But it, here it's kind of an autistic uh, way, so I, I will not read. But I could list, because I have, while preparing the video, all the things that I have done consistently for the past 10 to 18 months, very often, uh, I have been extremely consistent in what I believe is good most of the things that I've listed here, plus other stuff. Uh, so here it's connected with what I said at the beginning, the weight of words. I can say things mindlessly, what I might say, or uh, without uh, things that I regret having said. Uh, okay, okay, but when I say things which are intelligent, uh, and, and I know they are intelligent and they are good in a way, with all the ambiguities of, uh, that I've listed, uh, that I've mentioned in this video about. Yeah. Uh, I try to put uh, weight to, to at least some of the words that I, that I speak because I back this up with, with practice, with constant daily practice. Yeah. When I understand that things that I do or have done or did were wrong, or if the word wrong were not adequate or adapted, or uh, okay, when I do understand, sometimes it takes me a long time, but when I do understand, I try to improve uh, immediately. And, and in the in the in the best way possible, I have. I'm very self-critical. When I realize that okay, I did okay, wrong, bad idea, okay, wrong, mistake, error, wrong. I try to correct to by improving and by changing as efficiently as possible yeah i'm not saying that i'm good i'm saying that when i when i realize when i understand it can take me a lot of time i can be stupid for many of the aforementioned reasons sometimes but when i understand okay this was a wrong this was wrong now i have to change improve modify adapt okay 
I have a faculty as an individual to be very self-aware, which causes me a lot of suffering, but that's just my personal problem. But it's, it's a good aspect about me is that I can be very self-aware. And when I realize, okay, wrong, I try to change, to improve. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not saying that it's enough. I'm not saying that it's... Uh, adequate but if i had to show self-compassion which is partly the purpose of this video when i realize okay i've made a mistake i've made a mistake i try to improve while here virtue signaling virtue signal <laughs> that's a joke but I'm a process. There are uh, difficult moments in the process. And I have here, I, I, I've already mentioned this uh, maybe many times. And I, I genuinely ask myself this question. I genuinely do. I have a personal answer. That I would share only with. Uh, special person. When you are in a relationship, from the perspective of a woman, let us say, putting on makeup for, uh, I don't know, your, your boyfriend, your husband, etc. Is it, is it a, an act of love? In a way, most of the time, I guess it is because it shows that you make efforts, you try to look the best that you can to impress uh, your, your partner. Yeah. But here, yeah. my uh, emotional aspect. I'm well aware that not putting makeup and saying to uh, your partner, this is how I look without um, without makeup.
I could uh, speak, or I had other things to say, but... Uh, I know, I know that uh, some some humans they like uh, well, whatever. It's difficult. Okay, uh, <clears throat> I will stop the video here.